Thank you very much for this invitation. I'm really delighted to speak now. I mean, I, could, I would really like to make a comment or a link of my talk to every speaker. And well, this would cost me a lot of time. And, but I, oh, uh, so this is the microphone, yeah. So thank you for the invitation. And uh, this is a really great conference. And I would li really like to make a link in my talk to every speaker who spoke to me. Of course, this was, would cost me a lot of time. And maybe sometimes I sneak in a keyword from from your talks. Um, and uh, So uh, my talk is the King's and Beauty Contest and it basically consists of three parts. The economic uh, system, that's the uh, model land, the mind, that's the bounded rational behavior, and the brain, that's what we saw uh, this morning, um, uh, that all this belongs together. And I show that uh, very practical. I involved many of you, so I had 80 participants, which is a really high hit rate um, out of the entire audience. I involved you all in a game in order that you really get a taste and emotionally arose um, uh, what I'm going to talk about. Yeah? So I hope all those who participated really get a very great understanding, all those who did not participate, and some of you um, got in doubt, and you go, uh, went so far that you looked at the instruction, and then you got cold feet. It was another and one of you already said to me, well, I'm not used in this, and uh, I didn't know how to make predictions. Um, you have to be brave. I mean, the first lesson you should learn from my talk is do experiments. Actually, people experiment on you. Any click you do on internet, you are experiment on. Oh, not any, but many of those. So you're constantly in the experiments. And if somebody asks you to participate in an experiment, maybe do it, yeah? Because you could learn a lot about your emotions, about your reasoning, and so on and so on. So I talk about the experiment. I will talk you, uh, then come to um, a general model which I constructed with the help of many others, uh, many other papers, which is the model land. And of course, one critical question is, is this model land good? And can we get out of it? And the short answer is we can actually get out of it. And the central bank actually told, tells us how to get out of it. Because they just go on the street and say, make a prediction on inflation next week. And that's, I think, pretty model free. So they are really, <laughs> uh, um, I mean, uh, people like Mike Woodford, who did all these great models, they actually asked, do you like cheese A or cheese B? Yeah, so you see, this is pretty model free. Of course, the neuroscientists create a model out of this also. Then I come to a bounded rational model, um, which really came out of me being a subject in LSE, actually, uh, in 1991. And I show you how this works I mean, with the data. Um, I show you with your data. I show you um, <coughs> that this is a good model. And then I show you also one slide with brain, so to make the connection to this morning. And of course, the important question is, um, does this have consequences for macroeconomics, and especially behavioral macroeconomics? I have basically started 10 years ago to work with macro theorists, and so we um, uh, first uh, did conferences, workshops, like here, and then uh, this created new um, interactions. And finally, three years ago, Level K actually entered into macro theory <laughs> models, assuming that these models are right. Um, and so I briefly talk about this. So the general goal is, of course, um, the interaction between experimental, behavioral, empirical, and theoretical macroeconomists and microeconomists, <coughs> and we use elements from natural sciences, psychology, and I sneak in also a word about humanities. Um, so what is the Keynesian beauty contest? I mean, maybe many of you know it um, from the famous book by Keynes uh, on employment interest rates. Um, so he says, talking about professional investment, well, they are investors. They, they could look at fundamentals, but what they also have to take into account is um, what other uh, investors do. So basically, he constructs a game, and this is the essential part of my talk. He constructs a game where you have to elect six prettiest faces of 100 photographs, and the prize is awarded to the person who is most clear, uh, uh, nearly to the average uh, preferences. Well, he could just be a uh, game theorist and says, well, there are many equilibria, because er every face is a potential equilibrium outcome. But he doesn't say that. He doesn't talk about equilibrium. Well, wasn't really so established at that time. And he says, well, 
and then he comes to a bounded rational model, yeah? And he says, well, what you really have to do, you don't have to say what you like, you don't even have to think what the average thinks, but you have to think what the average thinks the average is doing. So um, he is basically giving us the bounded rational model, and all I basically did in my thesis is to visualize what he said. Uh, I had to do a little trick. I mean, if you look at this, the problem is if I think what the average is, if I choose the average, and I think what the average thinks about the average, it's still the same average. Yeah, so you don't have higher order beliefs, uh, and these higher order beliefs are actually the problem in uh, uh, macroeconomics. So we do a little trick, and if you did the experiment, the trick is just not to say you have to guess the average, but you guess two thirds of the average, and then it's true. Because then you unravel, unfortunately, to zero. Because if you got hit the average, you take two thirds. And um, so this is basically my talk. Yeah. So I have talked about the economic system. I have talked about a model. And actually, in '91, I also thought, well, it would be cool to look into the brain because can the people really say what they think? And uh, we can doubt that. And psychologists doubt that sometimes. And then I thought, it would be really cool to look into the brain. And I thought, wow, what a cool thought. And this is absolutely impossible to look into the brain. And in 1998, I learned, <coughs> indeed, that you can look in the brain with fMRI. And that's what I will show you on one slide. <coughs> if I don't lose my voice. Um, <coughs> so, <coughs> your experiments. So you have to be closest to 10 plus two thirds of the average. Yeah? So um, <coughs> the average, you know what the average is. 10 is actually the fundamental value. <coughs> or a large player has said 10. Yeah? And the payoff is according to the distance function. So, um, yeah, what's the first step? Well, the first step for an economist is to look at the equilibrium, and this is actually 30, and I will not calculate that um, for you. I mean, this is just um, a fixed point, and it's actually Pareto optimal. <coughs> so if we all do that, we all get the highest payoff. Yeah, so there's no competition between us. We all get a nice <coughs> payoff. It's unique. So theoretically speaking, it's pretty boring. Let's just do it. Well, all those who have done it, they will probably say it was pretty tough to do this. Now, I have to talk about uncertainty. And I do a trick as an experimenter. We do, um, we do variations and we change the uh, instructions a little bit. <coughs> and so what we do, uh, thank you. Um, we uh, have two treatments. One is where you choose between 0 and 100. And one, you can take any number, positive, negative. And if you have actually this um, limit, then you have a dominated area. You should definitely not choose below 10, because <coughs> if the average is zero, 10 is the optimal number, and then <coughs> that's between zero and 10, you should not choose. And similar, mm. between 60, um, 76 and 100, you should not choose. Yeah? So this is actually much easier than if you have any number. So you have much higher uncertainty out of equilibrium when you have choices of any number uh, in comparison to when you have a bounded set, right? So <coughs> this should give some prediction that there's, if people are not in equilibrium, there's a higher spread in the first than in the second. Well, um, so the design is basically this. We uh, give instructions <coughs> um, with a interval, unbounded interval, and then we also invite you, and we say, you play against the other audience, or you play against the undergrads. Let's see whether there's a difference. <coughs> so we have in total um, two conferences where we did this, with 184 subjects and 140 undergrad subjects. So I show you the data um, of this, these different treatments. So let's first look at undergraduates. So those with a bounded interval, let's see where I find, oops, this is not good. Well, you see on the top, um, those who choose between 0 and 100, and on the bottom, 
between um, those with any number. And you see a clear shift. I give you some <coughs> statistics. The mean is 42 and, uh, in the first one, and uh, the mean is 14 in the second one. So there are big differences. Yeah? There's a large spread. And um, so, um, so we have this heterogeneity. Yeah, so this is, um, uh, yeah, with this ha a large heterogeneity, I mean, predictions become very difficult, but we have to uh, take into account these kinds of heterogeneities. We see spikes. We see spikes at 50, and we see spikes at 43. So what is 43? Well, 43 is 50 times 2 thirds plus 10. Yeah? So in the first one, actually, people have a completely different reference point. They think uh, interval from 0 to 100, 50 is the midpoint, because I don't know what to choose, and then they iterate from there. Um, not everybody does that. Yeah? So those people who have, um, you see also spikes at um, 20, these are more likely people who go from 10 um, upwards. Yeah? 10 times 2 thirds plus 10 is 16, and, and so on. Um, in the lower graph, well, there's no interval. What can you do? You just say 10. And it's a focal point, yeah? And um, so you see the spikes there. So these are equilibrium-wise exactly the same um, conditions. Of course, if, you, um, <coughs> if uh, one has iterated emulation of dominated strategies, the other one does not, yeah? So we cannot just rely on um, rationality or common knowledge of rationality in order to look at the data point. Now, if we go now to you as the participants, <coughs> and you have to make a guess what these undergraduates guess, you will see that many choose just the equilibrium. Yeah? But again, you see white had, um, you see differences between those who play in the interval case and those who play in the um, no interval case. Yeah? So when we make predictions, we really have to think about the environment, who is playing, and, and so on and so on. And um, clearly we see, we, uh, many of you know what the equilibrium is. Now, if you play against um, the conference, if only you play within each other, then you see um, there's still <coughs> quite a uh, heterogeneity. So there's no difference um, between, no um, difference between um, uh, uh, the setup against the conference of the conference uh, people in the conference and other things. Yeah? But again, we see a sharp shift when, when we come to the open interval. Yeah? So when we think of bounded rationality, we have to consider much more the components than just the equilibrium. So um, let's also look at behavior over time. Yeah? And I here take um, actually a different set of um, uh, experiments. And these are experiments with Haymeyer and Adel, where Karth also is involved. And we actually say they don't know the environment. They don't know ex at all uh, the experiment they are playing. Can we still see patterns? Can we make predictions? Is the equilibrium something, something essential? Yeah, it could be that the equilibrium has a no bite at all. Yeah, and here we see on the left hand side we have negative feedback. So instead of having minus two thirds of the average, we have um, a plus two thirds of the average, we have minus two thirds of the average. And this is the so-called negative feedback round. And we see that people are very well in equilibrium. They don't even know the environment, but somehow the forces um, uh, immediately let them go to equilibrium. While in the posit positive feedback, um, this is not the case. So um, you fluctuate greatly around the fundamental. The fundamental has still a bite. And here the equilibrium is just different because the numbers are different. And there's also some noise in the test. But, but this is not really relevant. So <clears throat> what we can say is, I mean, we are using these models. We somehow believe these models are important for macroeconomists. And this is what I will show you in the second step, um, uh, in the second part of the talk. Yeah. So we can put people in this uh, kind of environment. We use a model, so we are not in the bowl. <laughs> oh, let's not use a model at all. Um, we understand very well the equilibrium, the mathematics. Yeah and also the difference when it's bounded and when it's not bounded, or et cetera, et cetera. But we get very different outcomes. Yeah? So we get much more um, 
um, instability. And the question is, if these models have any bite in reality, can we get rid of these instabilities by changing the equations of these models? Yeah, and that's what this is um, also what has been done. Okay, so um, now I want to come to a more general framework. So <coughs> I want that we use basically the economic system, which is given, it's almost like an objective system, yeah, with the equilibrium. Then we have the mind, yeah, that's us, that's you, yeah. And with all your ideas, and I mean, the ideas can be, I choose a random number, I choose my favorite number, and you gave me comments what you chose, yeah, uh, and, and then the brain, and uh, can we learn from that? Is there some regularities that actually macroeconomists can use? And the good answer is already yes. And macroeconomists very recently have started to use um, these kinds of um, ideas, uh, which um, um, uh, Colin Kammer, for example, uh, Rankrell, uh, and many others have established in microeconomics, and which is now floating slowly into macroeconomics. So what is the uh, economic system? Well, it's a co-dependence um, of the system, which I showed you, these other equations I showed you, and the equilibrium. Then we have the mind, that's you, and I add also <coughs> nature. Actually, um, this system I found um, actually through another um, search of what's the problem, and I, uh, I found it in Hegel. <coughs> Logic, spirit, and nature, and I cannot now tell you how, how I got to Hegel. I got it not through my work in economics, but it, I got it basically by saying, what's wrong in economics? Okay, can I find what's wrong in other sciences? And one was, what's wrong in uh, religion? And Hegel is really fascinating and helping me to organize the system. I mean, I had this basically before, these three bullet points, but. Um, you can uh, smooth it better, you, can, uh, you have a better base, I mean, you stand basically on the uh, shoulders of Hegel, uh, and not on the ground floor, so that's a little bit more comfortable. <laughs> and I basically, in my next slides, I want to show you the world as a beauty contest game. Yeah, so I sh the beauty contest ca came from a, another giant, that is Keynes. I don't know whether Keynes saw that this is really a good model. And, um, and then, this is basically what um, I and many, many others, so that's not only around the beauty contest, um, uh, I have this reasoning, that's what um, Carlos, for example, is talking about. And I put equilibrium here, because uh, the mind, the equilibrium is also uh, in here. Yeah? So, um, we uh, start with the economic system. And so, actually, I found a very good function. And this com is basically coming out of a of an econometric paper by Jasper Nadi. And this is basically your choice. When you think of choosing, you have to think what all others are doing. Then some constant, yeah, so some constant, uh, that was 10 in our example, and maybe something which is idiosyncratic to you, the epsilon i. And maybe there's also future in it, what others will do in the future. I mean, we are talking about macroeconomics. So basically, um, I, uh, you, you should know the 2 thirds is the b, the C was the 10, and I don't want to get into this too much, but we can also think of strategic substitutes and complements, yeah, and as I showed you in, um, in this slide, yeah, it's very different whether you have minus B or plus B. You get more stability when you have minus and more uh, less, and if I had more time, I could explain that, and I could explain that to anybody on the street, actually. <clears throat> So let me give one macroeconomic example <laughs> to show you what I want to develop next. Yeah? So with this formula, this is really a magical <coughs> formula, I can uh, basically reconstruct many, many models if you're an economist. Um, so you know prisoner's dilemma. Everybody probably knows prisoner's dilemma. So I can construct with this kind of equation and system uh, prisoner's dilemma in this model. But <coughs> if you know the new Keynesian models, this looks very difficult. <coughs> many letters, but actually I can reduce the inflation function yeah, to this function as uh, just incorporating some output gap function in, in this inflation function. And then it becomes exactly what I played with you. Yeah, C plus whatever you guess. 
and there is a t plus 1. I can tell you the brain does not really distinguish between t plus 1 and t. Yeah? It doesn't matter. Yeah? As long as you sit there and you have no input from outside, that makes not a difference. I mean, mathematically, it can make a difference. So then we come to a nice picture, and I cannot go into the details, but this will be in the paper. Yeah, so you have basically a continuous strategy space. Yeah, you can choose um, within a limit or unlimitedly continuously, or you have your famous prisoner's dilemma, and what you know, AB. Yeah? But then you have the strategic substitutes, so minus two thirds or plus two thirds. And these are, but I mean, if you don't find yourself, if you're an economist, and you don't find yourself in this. Um, table, tell me, because <laughs> for example, the growth model sneaked in after my last conference where I thought, oh, this is not in there. Yeah? But basically, we can structure now with the Keynesian beauty contest game, a lot of games, and we have the problem at the moment to ask ourselves what is not in this model. So what is the mind? And I just show you one um, level, and, and I have already told you, the mind basically says, oh, what should I choose? 50, 0 to 100, well, 50, 50 times 2 thirds, plus 10, or if the others do that, I should take this number, um, 43 times 2 thirds plus 10. And of course, I get to 38 or something. Yeah. So this was basically in my thesis. Um, I created that with a very simple model, um, I mean, without the C. And I chose actually in the simple mm -hmm. model, 2 thirds of the average between 0 and 100, 22, and I was very proud of myself because I thought I am uh, advanced and I know more than the others because I'm an advanced experimenter. So um, basically, this is what I constructed there, and this is actually finally the theory that has found its place in some papers in Bakro. Yeah, so they they say we don't just calculate the equilibrium, but we also want to see what happens out of the equilibrium, especially when we have bounded rational subjects. Yeah. So the applications of that is now quite wide in economics. Uh, it's in microeconomics, epistemic game theory, and of course the most important for here is in macroeconomics. And take, um, uh, for, for example, quantitative easing yeah, can be used. So you, those of you who know a quantitative easing model, yeah, it basically has no relevance. I mean, there should be no problem in uh, theoretically speaking, but if you put in um, level K, then you get nice um, bounded rational outcomes. So nature, brain. We saw already um, something on the brain. So how do we do that with the brain? We put people in the scanner, and maybe some of you have been in the scammer. scanner, it makes a lot of noise. Um, but we now give them a screen, and they see the instructions, they have to do something, so we give them a, a stimulus. We connect this <coughs> with the already uh, model there, behavioral model level K, and then we get also a nice picture, which we have seen before. So that's basically um, uh, the, uh, the brain seen from the front. And um, I, will, I don't want to go into detail what happens here. Let me just tell you, there are some of you who chose 43. And uh, you should probably, I, should, I might probably just see the, something lit up in the ACC that's re self-reflection, so you really don't know what the others are doing. Yeah? But if you go already one level higher, then you see uh, activity in the middle prefrontal cortex. Yeah? So we showed that with a uh, simpler fight version where you just had to guess two-thirds of the average. Yeah? So you see here the um, interaction between neuroscientists, uh, economists, and hopefully later also computational co economists. So let me already come to the discussion. So what is the aim of the talk? We want to create a behavioral microfoundation of behavioral macro theory. <coughs> so, um, that, that basically means we, we don't doubt that the models are maybe so wrong, the new Keynesian models, but just calculating the stationary equilibrium, which is very important for my work, as I showed you, is not enough when we have face people. Yeah? So if you wonder as a <coughs> macroeconomist why in the reality you don't see um, your equilibrium outcome, um, maybe it's because that the people don't follow your thoughts. They don't unravel until they get to equilibrium, or they don't even know your models uh, 
uh, numbers. I mean, I gave you two thirds times the average plus 10, and many of you calculated the equilibrium, but in reality, people cannot calculate the equilibrium. So they have to anyway come up with other guesses. So we work with um, psychologists, neuroscientists, and um, I showed you Hegel, so that's why I put in uh, humanities. So economic models are amazingly important for us. Yeah, so I studied game theory with Reinhard Selten in Bonn, um, and it was always clear we need to know well um, game theory. Yeah, but um, we have in the real world the problem of uncertainty, and maybe we don't know the parameters of the models, and we don't know who the others are, yeah, or we make mistakes. Yeah, so as an economist, we have to take that into consideration. So I showed you a bounded um, rational model, and fascinating, and finally, I mean, what I have hoped for 30 years, sometimes you have to wait a long time, uh, macroeconomists also using it in their models. Yeah, and um, the brain really helps us to see um, what, what um, I mean, what kind of stimulus do we need maybe to um, get you into a bit different choice, and it was just fascinating, I and mean, that's very descriptive to see somebody who chooses 43, yeah, that is 50 times two thirds plus 10, is, has a very different brain reaction than somebody who then goes from 43 times um, two thirds plus 10, yeah? But the problem is that the environment, whether you have a bounded interval or an open interval, it gives you completely different um, uh, reactions. So if you are a macroeconomist and you say, oh yeah, I use this or that policy, yeah, you might be surprised that people are triggered by how much they have in their pocket. Yeah, <laughs> so they don't care um, that you give them a nice, um, uh, uh, that you give them a, a game where they can um, invest a lot in the stock market or etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. If their conditions are, they are faced um, uh, on something very different, then um, uh, they cannot uh, react in the right way. But they, uh, there's positive, at least there is nice um, uh, interaction already with, tho uh, with those who build macroeconomic models. So, so to, to me, for guidance, so actually Mike Woodford was the first person to uh, introduce level K, and I must say, I banged it on his head. I mean, I was in uh, New York in 2012-13, I was also with, uh, uh, together with Andrew Kaplan, and the, the talks basically were always on rational inattention or level K, I don't know, that was my impression. But it took uh, Mike do, um, do, uh, two years uh, or so till he finally accepted that this micro model might be interesting. And a question to, or a link to the previous session, yeah, <laughs> so, ha, huh, what do these models, do they really help us? And you know, central bankers, um, they are the closest co-workers, and they really like our work, I, so I got an invitation out to the ECB, uh, and I have also given a talk in New York Fed. Um, they actually say, oh, shall we do this beauty contest, and the New York Kings, and, you know, we start from scratch, and you know what they do? They go on the street and ask, what's your inflation expectation tomorrow? <laughs> yeah. So they make basically, um, uh, they, they ask the experts and non-experts. So they are then pr practically in a model-free room. Yeah? They, they don't give a model. Um, but also in surveys, they, um, uh, there's now a survey uh, where they just say, OK, um, guess what other people are guessing. Yeah, so in these kinds of surveys. So that's the link then again to the beauty contest. Here. So basically what I have shown you, I have shown you that the economic system, <coughs> so economists, they are actually the best people to model economic situations or situations, interaction. I think that's the most brilliant part. And my advisor, Reinhard Selten, disentangled very much the economic situation from the, uh, from the solution <coughs> because um, when you do math, you, you have to be practical, and rationality is a practical concept. And so, but there's a nice link now to all kinds of people, and uh, I hope we can fruitfully work all together. Okay, thank you.